So I think we are all set now. We can just start our wonderful webinar this morning. Hello, everyone. I'm Shasha, and I would like to thank you for joining us at the Next Gen Observability using open source monitoring webinar. Our today's speakers are coming from Opscrews. Scott Fulton, uh, he's CEO at Opscrews, and Alok Guha, he's CTO at Opscrews. We are extremely delighted to have a guest speaker with us, Carl Governor, former Chief Information Officer of Northwestern Mutual. Before we start, just a few housewarming rules. This webinar, the talk will be about a half an hour long, followed by the demo part, and, uh, and then we will have Q&A uh, session at the end of the talk. After the talk, it's a Q&A. As I mentioned, you can submit your questions in the section below under the Q&A during the webinar, and we will try to answer to all of them at the end of the talk. This webinar will be also recorded, so in, you will have a chance to review it um, once we send you a link uh, later on. Uh, thanks again for joining, and I'll let Scott Fulton, CEO of Opscrews, uh, take it from here. So, Scott, stage is yours. Yeah, well, well thank you, uh, uh, Sasha, and um, I welcome everybody this morning or this afternoon, depending on where you're, you're dialing in from. And um, uh, I know there's a lot of distractions uh, in, the, in the world today, uh, and everybody's moved to virtual, and so just getting any... Uh, time uh, with folks like you uh, is uh, is precious, and so thanks for um, uh, uh, making uh, the time this morning. Uh, you know what we want to talk about uh, is this real shift that's going on uh, in the industry. Uh, uh, obviously, many of you are on this journey uh, to cloud native apps. I, I, you you see many changes here in the '90s when we had distributed applications. Uh, you know to the uh, you know early 2010s. Uh, when we started taking those existing apps and lifting and shifting them to the cloud, uh, you know, to the decade we're just embarking on, uh, where we're really trying to take advantage, uh, you know, of the cloud uh, ar architecture and benefits and, and really refactoring those apps into uh, microservices and containerizing them and whatnot. Uh, I mean, that shift uh, is in full swing. Uh, and Gartner estimates, uh, as you can see in the quote below, that uh, you know, a vast majority of workloads uh, will be containerized uh, in the next uh, three to four years. And that agenda, as you probably know, in, in most organizations is, uh, is driven uh, by the developers and the business units uh, and the folks that are in you know, operations or site reliability engineering teams. Uh, in many cases, they're you know, struggling to keep pace uh, with that kind of change because there's just a heck of a lot of new challenges. Uh, you, know, you have an order of magnitude more components uh, that you have to manage that make up uh, you know, these modern applications. Uh, you're releasing a heck of a lot more frequently. Uh, you, you have many more applications uh, than you had uh, a decade ago. So much of the business is, is, is driven you know, by digital transformation. Uh, and then the dependencies uh, that are out there are pretty, pretty significant. You know, you used to write an app and, and all the different uh, components and services that made up that app were under your control. You know, these days, if you're a commerce, e-commerce company and you're doing logistics uh, and tracking that, uh, that's a third party service you're calling out to. If you're calculating sales tax, that's probably another third party service that you're uh, taking advantage of. And uh, if you're using geolocation, that's probably a third service. And so uh, the dependencies are pretty significant in, in a modern application. And so then when you think about, uh, you know, monitoring uh, those apps, uh, you know, those modern apps need uh, a modern approach to observability. Uh, the kinds of tools that, uh, you know, were popular and worked, you know, in the, in the 90s, you know, aren't going to be the same tools uh, that are architected to support, you know, the current uh, set of environments. And so what we see uh, is that, you know, in the, the tools of the, of the 90s and the 2000s that, you know, served the apps of that time, uh, they were fairly proprietary. You know, you'd go in, you'd set thresholds, uh, you'd uh, triage things and do resolution uh, by kind of jumping between different screens of different tools. Uh, you tended to have one tool for logs, another for traces, uh, you know, another for, for metrics. Uh, and so the net effect was, you know, they were pretty expensive to kind of buy uh, and run. Uh, and that's just not plausible, uh, you know, in the, uh, in, the, in, the, in the next generation of apps. Uh, what we see the industry moving to 
somewhat ind independent of, of ops crews is, you know, an open source uh, foundation uh, for monitoring. Uh, a vast percentage, you know, of the R&D spend of those companies on the left, and I worked at several of them over my uh, career, uh, was spent on, you know, the, the sheer fact of having, making sure you have agents that support all the platforms, uh, making sure you could aggregate, you know, all the metrics and logs in a central place, uh, and they had good visualization technology for dashboards. That's where a big amount of the spend was. Today, that's much more plausible, that foundation layer. Uh, is much more plausible through uh, the open source tool sets uh, that are proliferating on the market. And, and then on top of that, if you can automate a lot of those things and if you can put analytics, uh, uh, then you can really drive you know, pretty significant cost savings and more predictability around your apps. So, you know, what's driving this change? Why, why is open source monitoring, you know, becoming more popularized? Well, I, you know, we have a few kind of key theories around it. One is that the infrastructure tech stack itself is, is, is increasingly open source. You know, think of the databases you use to build modern apps. It's probably a Mongo, it might be an Elastic, uh, a MySQL. Uh, those are open source. You know, uh, 20 years ago, most apps were built on Oracle. Same thing with messaging, same thing with analytics. So the tech stack is open source. And so it's just a natural extension that the monitoring uh, will be open source as well. Uh, there's a lot of new instrumentation uh, standards uh, out there. You know, you have something like C Advisor around containers. It doesn't matter what VM that container runs on. It has the same set of uh, instrumentation that you can depend and, uh, and rely on. Uh, and the community is driving that. I think there's also just a lot of, uh, you know, changing priorities for these uh, modern uh, apps, you know, it used to become, it used to be critically important to understand what was happening, you know, in the code, uh, you know, of a, sig of a single VM or a single, you know, set of binaries. Now with microservices, it's more, it's more important to understand what's happening uh, between all those services. So at the networking layer and the latency and response time and whatnot is almost, if not more important than, you know, what's happening in a, in a, in a small segment of the code. Uh, and then, you know, one of the last is just the, you know, instrumentation can be used for a lot of different uh, purposes. Uh, you know, you used to aggregate all this stuff and ship it off to your monitoring tool. And then you had, uh, you'd aggregate the same stuff or very similar and ship it off to your security tool and, and then do it again for your capacity planning. And so, now, uh, with these standards, there's the possibility where you can collect this stuff once, uh, own it in these tools, and then, uh, uh, you know, ship it off for different, different business purposes, you know, as opposed to every proprietary tool uh, aggregating and collecting this stuff on their own. So that's, those are some of the key things that's kind of driving the change uh, that we see, uh, and not to mention, obviously, the cost of the, of the proprietary tools that are out there. So what are some of the popular ones? There, there are many. Uh, the, the ones that we most closely follow are around uh, CNCF, so the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, uh, you know, that has Kubernetes as its kind of anchor and foundation project that's, you know, really becoming, uh, you know, the operating system uh, for cloud applications. Uh, and so uh, Kubernetes provides a rich set of telemetry uh, both from a configuration perspective and a metric perspective and a networking perspective, uh, you know, that can be used and analyzed in, in, in higher level uh, tools. And then on the top, we have kind of four key areas, metrics uh, through Prometheus. Uh, Prometheus uh, was one of the first projects to graduate uh, CNCF after Kubernetes. Uh, it's a time series metrics database, uh, you know, very simple to use, you, you just have uh, a metric and, and some key value pairs. Uh, it has a very powerful uh, SQL query engine, uh, you know, behind it. Uh, hundreds of different exporters for every database and middleware component that you can imagine. Uh, it was authored by uh, Julius Volz, uh, who's uh, one of our uh, board advisors, uh, you know, at Opscrews. He, he came out of Google. I uh, and invented it in sound uh, in SoundCloud uh, and and still is very active uh, in that in that community. But uh, you know Julius is complimented by some 500 other committers that are out there uh, in the community. A close cousin to Prometheus is is Loki, um, uh, which is you know all about uh, uh, aggregating uh, uh, logs uh, uh, in a multi-tenant system. Uh, and having some of the same attributes, uh, you know, of uh, Prometheus. So doing all your kind of searching and indexing and so forth of logs, uh, you know, through Loki. 
uh, uh, for traces, uh, there's the Jaeger project. Yeah, Jaeger came out of Uber. I, 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 and it really is at the intersection between observability uh, and networking and uh, helping you understand uh, uh, the, the trace path, latency, errors uh, between all the microservices and containers uh, that make up a modern application. Uh, you know, it does sampling and, and really its primary, primary role in life is for uh, offline analysis to do debugging uh, you know, of the code. It's, it's really a favorite uh, of, the, of the development community themselves. So net net, you know, all of these, uh, these, these four areas, uh, they have a powerful set of features, a lot of contributors, um, uh, a really rapid adoption. And then um, uh, the great thing about these projects that we've seen, they haven't really been bastardized by all the commercial vendors. Um, uh, we see, you know, uh, many, many vendors just offering exporters uh, to the ecosystem. Uh, you know, for their area of uh, technology, and that's just great, uh, great to see. Uh, you know, just to give you a sense of how fast it's really moving, uh, for those of you that have uh, a little gray hair like, like myself, uh, you'll, you'll uh, be familiar with Nagios. Uh, Nagios was probably the most popular open source monitoring tool in the late 90s, early 2000s, uh, and it's still active, uh, still has a very active community. Um, but, you know, uh, in the scheme of things, relative to all the proprietary, you know, monitoring foundations that were out there, it had relatively small, uh, you know, market share. And you compare that to Prometheus, uh, you know, that's only four to five years old. Uh, you know, it has 50 times the adoption. If you look at kind of the different metrics around GitHub stars, uh, it has 10 times more contributors. Uh, if you do kind of uh, search analysis on Google, uh, it's off the charts. So just in a, in a short span, uh, you know, much greater adoption than we saw in kind of the prior generation of tools uh, for many of the reasons that I mentioned on the, on the prior slide. So to get, uh, you know, a perspective, uh, you know, on this, we wanted to bring in, uh, you know, uh, Carl, uh, uh, who's been a Fortune 500, uh, you know, C CIO for much of his uh, career uh, and has seen a lot of these uh, trends. So I'll turn it over to you, Carl. Okay, Scott, sound check. Everything good there? You can hear You're me? You're all good. Okay, well, uh, thank you. And it's great to be here with this crew. Uh, great to be talking to infrastructure and operations professionals because we all know the development community tends to innovate, 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 but then uh, they kind of forget about uh, the management, the operations, the monitoring, and all these things that have to happen. So as a senior technology executive and one that has seen multiple generations of this thing, uh, you have to... Uh, you, when you look at value, you look at it from three different lenses. You typically look at, you know, addition to the top line, uh, reduction of costs, and then, of course, risk. And so let's just talk a little bit about each one of those. Uh, from a revenue perspective, you know, poor monitoring can impact your net promoter score. It can, have, it can impact your uh, customer uh, stickiness or abandonment, depending on how you measure it. It also lowers your agility. And frankly, it could provide uh, just a poor, poor, poor uh, poor reputation issues, which leads to some risks that you may run. In terms of cost, you know, how frustrating it is to have an outage in your modern environment and you're chasing your tail trying to figure out where it is. Is it, is it the VM? Is it, is it the, the Kubernetes uh, pod? Is it, you know, what, where is this thing failing? And like Scott said, the complexity has gone up. The number of components continues to uh, go up. And so it's difficult to figure out where the outage could be or where the outage could be could come from. As in the case of Ops Cruise, what they do is they could predict some of these things because they have a model, a machine learning model that actually is looking at the behavior of the application. Hey, Carl, I would say here. that there's a, there's, a, there's a fourth element. Go ahead, Scott. No, I was just curious, you know, of those, of those three, and, you know, we have a lot of people that are uh, on the phone that are probably trying to justify these kind of things to um, uh, bosses like you, um, <laughs> which, is, which is the, which of these three is the hardest to measure and any, any tips on? Well, that? we'll start with the easiest and we all know what our cost structure is. So the easiest one is to say, you know, take it from a cost perspective. Okay. Uh, the I, always, sometimes the hardest one is revenue because, uh, nobody will look at operations as a source of revenue, but certainly if the system goes down and you cannot manufacture what you, what you make, or you cannot 
process what you issue, you know, depending on the business that you're in, if the system is down and you happen to be in healthcare and you can't uh, take care of patients, revenue is an issue, reputation is an issue on the risk side. So uh, those two tend to be harder. Cost yeah. is always easier. But I'll offer a fourth one. Okay. And the fourth one that I'll offer, which is not on this page, is experience. Uh, this fourth one could be a wrapper for all three of these. And that is, it's, it's very hard to, to measure, but net promoter score could be something that you could measure. And when you have your crown jewels in the digital world, inside of these modern environments, uh, the impact is significantly magnified. When your app is down, and that is the channel that your consumers are using to get to you, uh, it will not be very hard to just swipe, le swipe left or right and remove that app, whatever you're using, and go on to the competitor's app. And so that's why this is so important. Okay, good, good. So given all that, uh, the question is, uh, why are you using yesterday's generation of systems monitoring and apply to today's modern workloads? I mean, it's a question that you have to ask yourself. Uh, you have a couple, three choices really. Use something from the past that has been retrofitted and dealing with uh, uh, intrusive agents. Worse yet, ask application developers to instrument their code and put telemetry in their code so that you can monitor it. We all know after 30 years of trying that trick, that doesn't work. Uh, these uh, legacy type of systems monitoring technologies are also very noisy with lots of data, require manual intervention. They tend to be siloed, focus on you know, the mainframe operating system, focus on the distributed database side with Oracle or whatever you may be using. Uh, they're also proprietary, so you're locked in. So trying to take a legacy systems management technology that has been extended to quote unquote, manage Kubernetes is not the answer. They're intrusive and they're very expensive. So, uh, which leads to my next point, uh, Scott, yeah, on the next slide. One thing, one, one thing yeah. Carl. Um, yeah. I, can it go the other way? Can can the, the modern tools uh, manage the legacy apps, or is that too much to choose? Not not likely. It is not likely that the uh, modern tool, say for example, in the case of you all with op screws, you're not you're likely not going to invest on managing. Uh, CICS on the mainframe, right? right. You're going to leave yeah. that to yeah. IBM. They did it 30 years ago. That's going to happen. Could yeah. you have a potential integration with logs or messaging? Maybe. Sure. Uh, yeah. But the, you know, the, the pipe dream of the single console, the single intergalactic console that gives you everything you need from all of your systems. You know, we tried that with HP OpenView in the 90s and we all know where that led. Okay? Right, right. Yeah. So this is additive. And why wouldn't you? You yep. have modern workloads, you manage them with modern systems management technology, observability, and prediction as to what your, of the behavior of your application. Got it. Got it. Okay. Good. Um, which leads me to my next point, which is, uh, why would you use proprietary systems? On the next slide, uh, Scott, why would you use, oh, right there, yeah, uh, proprietary systems closed source systems, which lag typically in the uh, innovation in the operations and infrastructure space. And instead, I would want to use the power of the community, the, you know, the hundreds of developers, and it's going to continue to grow, that are uh, you know, Loki and Prometheus and all the things that Scott talked about, all those frameworks, are they going to continue to advance them? They're going to use the power of, of you know, the innovation that comes out of typically Silicon Valley and you, you should expect nothing but continued innovation over the proprietary closed-end source type of systems from your traditional vendors that exist out there. Now, the question is how, how you'll make this, how you'll integrate these and how, you, how do you make that work? That's something that uh, we're going to learn more about it. And then finally, think of what OpsCruise is doing as the commercialization of this uh, CNCF or Cloud Native Computing Foundation. Think of their commercializing uh, what is delivered through the open source. So instead of you having to roll your own, which we have done for past technologies, right? Everybody remember trying to roll your own distribution of Linux, downloading those distributions and then figuring out how to, how to make it work? Well, Red Hat made that easy. 
Same thing uh, with a vendor like Cloudera. They made Hadoop easy as opposed to downloading five things and then making version 7.6.2 work with version 3.4.7. You know, that work is being done for you with this commercialization of the CNCF uh, systems management, observability, and other families of software that exist within what uh, Scott just talked about. That's what they do. And so you can try it yourself. And with that, Scott, I'm going to turn it over to Alok. Great. Thanks, Carl. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Alok, you want to drive? Yes, thank you. Um, I'm just trying to get my screen back up here. Um, I'm going to take myself a video so I can uh, share my screen here, guys. All right. So picking up uh, where Carl and uh, Scott have talked about, let's talk about what the obstacle solution looks like, right? So one, think about it. Once we have this open ecosystem with, with the microservices, with Kubernetes, Prometheus, and all the collections, what can we, what do we need to do? We have a very dynamic environment. And in order to be able to be staying ahead of it, as, as Carl mentioned, we need to be more predictive rather than reactive, right? So what Opscrews does is build on top of that open source framework for monitoring that comes in these Kubernetes environments and essentially understand the application, which we talk about in a minute. And then once we understand the applications easily as it's changing, detect issues because we build uh, the behavioral model of every component that comprises the application. That allows us to go into detecting fault isolation because we understand the distributed structure. And then causal analysis because at the end of the day, that's what you want to get to, right? And the whole idea, of course, is to reduce the possibility of outages, we stay out of the curve. Now, something contrarian that we do, uh, as we have mentioned, is we don't think ops or SRE teams can be guessing what metrics to look at. There are so many components. You can have hundreds and thousands of containers and services and trying to guess all the metrics, there are tens of them in each, and then trying to figure out what the threshold is is not feasible at all. So one of the advantages there is understanding an ML-driven behavior model contextually and then understand when those behaviors have changed or there's a problem, right? And we want to do this, of course, without instrumenting the code or touching the application. Of course, we also avoid trying to maintain of the open source tool framework because that's already there. Why, why are we doing this? As we said, if we can be predictive, that reduces outages. That means your top line is above, right? As, as uh, Carl was mentioning, you know, your net promo score is up, your revenue is up. Uh, agility, if your apps, ops teams are more productive, less issues to handle, and of course, monitoring cost. So then, how do, then, then let's talk about how this works. Right, so if you think about the left-hand side being all those open source frameworks that we've already talked about, we are essentially, to use a, a term that one of our uh, customers have talked about, use the digital exhaust, pull that data in, and use it to both understand and build out the intelligence of the application, both its understanding and its structure. And then in background, for every component or service that comprises the application, build a predictive model. That allows us to essentially, once we know that, find out when there are deviations, right? Again, as we said, don't have to look for metrics or search for what to look for and when. That change of behavior across the whole Kubernetes state will tell us when there's a problem. Because we know the structure, we can then run it to do fault isolation. And if you can isolate the fault and we have enough detailed information from our ML model, which can also provide you explanations of where that model and why those shifts have happened that caused a potential problem, that allows us to narrow down, fence down the area where we need to focus on, and then find the corrective actions because we've narrowed it down to a granular level. Now, if you can automate that as we can in some specific Kubernetes cases, you can now close the loop. Now, the reason it cycles back is because applications change, infrastructure changes, scale out, scale in happens, right? Code changes are made. So this has to happen on a continuous basis, but essentially what Opscrews wants to do is help your ops teams and SRE teams to be on top of it on a continuous basis and keep running on the background to help ops teams stay ahead. It's important to understand 
that given all the different metrics and the telemetric we're using, how do we kind of move this? One of the primary things for us to be proactive and for ops teams to be able to handle that is start with the real-time metrics. It's like watching your self-driving car, looking at what's happening to see where the shifts are happening as opposed to, which has happened, which is looking at events and logs of failures and then working backwards. That's like CSI for your applications. So using the metrics that we have, and you'll notice there's one other uh, entity we've added, we also have to look at the cloud infrastructure, right? So using these open store framework and the cloud infrastructure, as we said, we understand the application structure, we build the behavior models, and in runtime, when the deviations, that allows us to detect problems that happen anywhere, and multiple of them can happen, and we do them all in parallel. Once that's done, we understand the global structure and the dependency that we've built from the application structure. That allows us to narrow down and see based on the dependency which one is the likely cause. And if you have specific events or let's say a, a, a failure in application component structure, we can then go to logs to confirm as opposed to look for logs and work backwards. So that's how we tie and log in this sequence. And then if you see on the bottom of the screen, many times failures and problems happen because a chain is introduced. A change could be because of an application code change, an infrastructure change, something happens, Kubernetes. When that happens, because we can also capture continuously what the structure and the application topology is using something called time travel for taking snapshots, we can now tie those changes back into that and kind of close the loop. Finally, how does trace come in? As opposed to trying to do full tail sampling, we can now say, if we narrow down the focus of where the problem is, we can now do directed trace analysis, such as with Jaeger, and look at the span itself. Now, this whole sequence of how we do it and how we integrate all of this holistically is key for us to be kind of being proactive and predictive. Now, remember, the, the one big advantage we have in the Kubernetes system is we don't have to worry about having multiple specific tools, whether it's for logs or metrics or tracing. It all comes in, unfortunately, in that whole Kubernetes ecosystem. So we are leveraging all of that in one place. This is the beauty of working with this open Kubernetes framework and ecosystem. How do we deploy? Uh, as we said, uh, we are not in the application space, right? So we don't have to be invasive. We can just sit in the monitoring plane and essentially collect data from those environments. And as you can see, we're collecting information on the cloud infrastructure, the Kubernetes configurations, the real-time metrics of Prometheus. We collect flows that essentially are the flows at both layer four and layer seven between every service pair of services that comprise the application. And finally, uh, collecting logs into the framework so we can confirm. Just using all of these, and these are deployed as open pods in your monitoring plane, we collect those, compress it, and send it down to our SaaS controller, where we do the processing and then feed it back directly to the operations for real-time viewing, alerting, tying it into their existing uh, incident management and ticketing system, right? So again, a full open framework without being intrusive while building and leveraging the intelligence that we have to build on top of that framework. So, um, it's a good time to now switch into kind of a demo mode. Let me do a little setup here. Uh, what you're seeing here is a, you know, a manageable application. This is a sample uh, simulated e-commerce application that we have here. When you look at these gray boxes, there are six of them. Uh, these are standard Kubernetes services. However, two of these, uh, the load balance and the ingress, as well as the database, are also used leveraging SaaS which is typical because not everything in your Kubernetes state and your application and your deployment will be just container service. They could be SaaS, could be serverless or API calls. So as an example, we're gonna use a elastic load balancer as an example as part of this state, as well as RDS as part of the database service as well as the backend. So we have, as you can see from this path, and uh, the reason is when we go to the demo, you'll see how we've kind of rebuilt auto-discovered and auto build this structure these three services from load balancing, the web service cache, to cart management to the database, and the bottom half. The blue ones are your 
typical pods. There are eight of them, and this is running on a five node Kubernetes service. And using those collectors, we're gonna essentially uh, build out and start providing that capability. Uh, so what we wanna do is uh, do two parts here. One, we'll talk about how Prometheus enables the open source monitoring. So let me spend a few minutes because as we said, Prometheus allows us to collect metrics from pretty much everything, in this case, the Kubernetes services. And of course, the open source uh, capability of dashboarding as Grafana, so we'll leverage that. We'll show you how that's done. Then the question is, how do we add this observability that we have? So understanding the application and structure, as well as the topology, which we call visibility, which is what we'll show as the first step using Opscrews. Second, what we call our behavioral analytics with leverages our ML. And we'll give an example of how we proactively detect a problem that leads to fault isolation. And third, tie back with the time travel to see what changes may have caused this. Now, just to make this interesting, uh, what we will do is we will inject a, a failure mode uh, in that application uh, on, a, on something that's what we call under the radar. For example, it has a cache element. We will change it and reduce the cache hit ratio to see what the implications are and see if our system detects it. So without much further ado, let me switch screens here into the uh, live demo screen here. I can get there. I think while we're waiting here, it'll be a good uh, reminder for people who have questions, submit them through the Q&A button. Uh, Welcome those questions in. We can start parsing through those. So what I just did, folks, is I moved into the Prometheus uh, monitoring using Grafana. So what you're seeing here, and I can actually update this. This is running for a while. So the top, top one here, if I can scroll up, you can see, is the, the CPU, I believe, the CPU utilization of all the services. And if I can scroll down here, you can see uh, the different ones were the database server, the cache, the Nginx. And you can see as we go down here, uh, we are getting continuously what the CPU usage is on our per basis. There is about six of those eight services. Some of them were outside the scope of this. So cart cache, cart server, DB server, Nginx payment, those are all the six servers we talked about. We can get the CPU of consumption at any time going over this. Of course, we have the full history of this. Similarly, when we talk about memory usage, uh, you can see the memory usage of this. And then finally, as you can see, if you go down here, we can also look at the writes. Primarily, the writes are happening on the database server, as you can see that. And when I hover on that, you can see that the amount of writes that are happening for all of those, right? So off the, out the bat, once you've deployed Kubernetes, this you essentially can pull up all the metrics, right? Now, what's the challenge here? We know the metrics. What we don't know, if you remember the structure of the application, we don't know how they relate to each other. This is where we need to build. Now, if you were the developer, you would know that, but often SRE teams don't have. So this is where we come in. And what we will do is essentially show you what it would look like if Opscrews were there. So what you're seeing here, for example, is exactly that same structure that we showed you before, basically auto-discovered and built uh, in the, uh, the application itself. So if I hover on this, you can see it coming from the ingress side, it actually goes into the ELB. If I click on it, you can see we've captures automatically from Kubernetes. We know this is uh, uh, the, the ELB from uh, the, uh, the cloud vendor, it goes into the Nginx service, goes into the corresponding container, goes into the, the one inside the application. And as you can see, when I hover on that, you can actually see the average response time between the Nginx service and its container. You can see 14 microseconds on that port. And when I go there here, you can also see, I can see the connectivity as well as the response time. And we have essentially discovered, coming from the ingress to the web server, to the two containers, to the cache element, to the card server that takes the data out of the cache to the database, right? And the, what the, the nice thing about this is the, the ops team didn't have to enter any of these names, all this structure, all these dependencies. Main reason is you can't even keep up with it, right? 
So that gives the immediate structure of this, but structure is only one part of it, right? So if I look at any of these Kubernetes servers, of course, we have all the aspects to this. What about the container that's sitting on? Remember, the container is sitting on not just this as a service, it's actually sitting on Kubernetes nodes and sitting on top of the infrastructure. So we provide you that dependency as well. So here's an example, the application tells you what the primary uh, metrics that are being used without your guessing on it, what's coming in and what's going down in which containers. And then for this service, what is it shared on that Kubernetes node? And then of course, where is that Kubernetes node sitting on what AWS, including its storage? So essentially you have the full service dependency at the top layer as well as the underlying dependency on Kubernetes and the cloud vendor. So let's just go into that just briefly. And as you can see here, this gives you the visibility of all those five Kubernetes nodes. And if I can just move this out here and scroll down, it's a little trickier, but you can see this one, two, three, four, five. And if you notice that IP address, it tells you exactly what the Kubernetes node is, all the allocation and how does it allocate across the containers that sit on. In fact, we want to give you a real time view of that. And so this is an example where you're trying to understand how much is being consumed in real time across all the key services. As you can see for the database on the cache, how much CPU and how much memory. Why is this important? Kubernetes can decide if you did not set the right limits and one of them is not set properly, an existing guaranteed uh, pod might take more of the resources and can evict. This allows us to be proactive by using this data and make sure that pods can be moved around for pod balancing. It also tells you what the sizing should be based on that. Now, let's go back to the application view that we have. Of course, we can understand metrics, right? So if you look at any of these metrics, remember all of that is coming in directly from Kubernetes and you know exactly what it's consuming uh, over the last one, uh, you know, whatever time frame. you'll notice we don't have to guess because we know what metrics are important and what's not. So there is no rights going on to this component. This allows us to build that behavioral model. So let's switch to that piece on what, how do we understand problems? The way we understand problems, as we said, is instead of guessing, we have built behind the scene a, a, a predictive model collecting data as it's running for every container and service that comprises the application. You'll notice there are two containers that look red here. Now, what that means is something detected as behavior changed. As I mentioned to you earlier, we essentially reduce the cache hit ratio. What's the implication of that? Well, you and I know that means I'm gonna have to pull more data out because it's not in their system. And it's gonna go downstream even though the total request coming to e-commerce service has not changed. Can we detect it? And the answer is yes. If for the same number of requests, the cache hit ratio was no longer the same, the system will say, let me tell you what I found. I found that I'm transmitting more data out and pushing out what we call our supply side to the outside, the total amount of counts. So this is going on continuously and being managed and we can provide insights to this even if the cache component hasn't failed, right? So this provides the detail on that and of course we can tie it to the applications and the metrics history, which we'll go back and see when did that change happen? And you will see when that change occurred, we know exactly when that happened, right? How much data and also the amount of CPU that processed. So that gives you a proactive view of starting to look at when things happen which might cause a problem. You'll notice there is a problem here on the database side. It went red. So if I click on that, that says, hey, I've got more CPU processing going on. It's probably because I have more data processing. And if I go to the insights again, I can tie it back to the metrics history and sure enough, and the question is, why did it go up? When, I, when someone like an ops team sees this, how does one decide which problem, which one caused the other? So one of the things we do, what we call ops tracing in real time, is provide something for the ops team as it's happening, before any failure happens, to be able to pull those services. And because we know the structure, we know all the paths, and we can see whether the dependencies are there. So one of the things we can do is say, let's look at the metrics across those, right? I'm gonna increase this to about an hour. 
And because it's going to be kind of small, I might change change the screw and go to some detail screen. Now, it's hard to see this detail, although you can see this. So what I'm going to do is show you the detailed view of how they are tied together, right? This is essentially taking the path from the cache to the cache management of the database. Let me switch around and show you a little more detail and zoom in on those that might be useful to look at so it can help you understand what's going on. So let me give me a minute here to switch screens and show you how I would find that. I can figure this out here. Coming back here, what you will see is, oops, I can show this again. Hopefully you can, so guys, you can see this. If I look at the uh, database server itself, you'll notice that it's total, the total amount of data going in, both uh, from the cache to the cache manage, the data starts increasing about the time when that change happened. Not only that, you can see the CPU utilization went up, which is what happened in the database. And then finally, the total amount of writes went up. So because we know this relationship, we know what led to, which is the cause, which is the effect. Real time, looking at the metrics and understanding the behavior and the structure. This allows ops teams to be ahead of time to say, hey, if it's invalidated, can I act on it? Allows us to do fault isolation, right? Without trying to do um, you know, detailed offline tracing. Finally, how does this tie into what change happened? So one of the things that we can do is monitor because we do something called taking snapshots, we can look at when these changes are happening at any one time. So as an example, if I look at this, I've taken a snapshot about an hour ago and you can see these containers are blue. There were no changes. A little, over, a little bit later, uh, about 26 minutes later, I think, when we introduced that change in the cache, if you go click back, you can see they went red. Again, nothing has failed. The question is, what caused this change? And what can provide you as this is happening is actually say, go look for the differences because as we know, changes cause problems. And if I click on this, we know exactly at what time those happened, when the database started increasing CPU. And then question is at this point, if that change happened, imagine if it was a code, I can roll back and essentially restore the application. In this case, we can't because the configuration on the cache was wrong and we have to decide whether we increase the configuration. So just to, so hopefully that gives you an idea of what we are talking about, how to do proactive observability on the application as we are talking about using this open frame. So let me quickly conclude on what word we are talking about here. So if I go back to uh, the, if I were to just summarize um, and kind of point out what we just did, uh, what we have essentially done is shared, uh, you know, provided you a view of how we went, just go back to the screen if I can see it. Essentially leveraging what we call frictionless, non-invasive existing monitoring framework that came at Kubernetes. Using that to build the application understand the structure and understand behavior and that dependency and all of that so that we know what's going on. You have this inside view holistically of the application. We also, without adding any code instrumentation, you can see live those changes, those flows, those dependency, without adding any additional heavyweight infrastructure. And use that intelligence in our runtime mode with that predictive capability to detect and isolate faults, right? Remember, there is no need to start guessing and deciding what to look for and what thresholds to set. No trying to figure out by correlation, which does not lead to causation of what is happening which means less false positives, less false negatives, less work, lower MTTR, lower MTTR means higher availability. With that, um, I'm gonna pass this over to Scott and thanks for taking the time. Thanks, uh, thanks Alok. So we'll, um, we'll switch to uh, uh, Q&A now. So we've got, uh, we've got some that have come in um, uh, via the chat window, and then some others that have come in through the actual uh, actual Q and A. Uh, so let's just let's just check that out. I've, I've answered some of them. 
Uh, this one's probably for you, uh, Alok. So uh, application infrastructure uh, behavior uh, itself changes quite frequently from release to release. Example, introducing a, a layer between two services like Apogee uh, will cause increased delay and possibly also CPU and memory usage. Uh, another example would be reduced um, or no caching due to the introduction of personalization. How long does it take for ops crews to learn that this is the new normal? Great question, and, and it's very, very relevant. So one of the things that we do is whenever we see a change that we detect from Kubernetes events or any other events, like even I didn't show this, but an image changed or infrastructure change, we would pull that up from the cloud layer or the Kubernetes layer. When that happens, uh, essentially what we are, we switch from being a pure predictive mode to a learning mode. We start collecting data and essentially go into this learning mode. So for any component that change or a new service that's been introduced, we start collecting data. Technically, you could start getting understanding of the application behavior in one hour. But really what you want is a wide range of operational behavior because what our ML model does is actually understand correct regions of operation. So for different demands and services. So typically in the default mode, within about 24 hours, we get the full understanding of an application and we can get in a predictive mode. More importantly, because we have not see the full range or demands or requests coming in, Every time we see a new change or a new demand so that we have not seen new data, we go back in to collect that data and make incremental upgrades. So if a change happened because you introduced a new service or uh, a, a infrastructure change, we would detect that and basically kick in to do that. Okay, good, uh, Alok. And then I see a second one here. Uh, are you able to see the exact data in the data flow along with the lack of encryption? Maybe either you or, or, or Sridhar. Uh, yeah, I think Sridhar is our resident. Uh, spot. Right now, we are collecting the data at the host level. So, you know, we are not, we are not, you're assuming that the app is not encrypting it. Uh, so we can collect the data through, because that's what Prometheus does to pull the data out. So uh, if it's coming out from there, we can see the data in the clear. And that's, by the way, that's where the industry is going. But I'm going to let uh, Sridhar comment on that because he's tracking this much more closely. Sridhar, you want to add to that? Sridhar might be on mute. Um, you know, if, if you want specific answers, we can follow up with Hi. you offline. This is, oh, yeah, Shridhar, I, yeah sorry, sorry, I had uh, my headset on mute. Um, uh, I, I trust you can hear me properly. Regarding that question, it depends on the environment we are uh, set up in. In certain cases, we get visibility to the, uh, the clear text, in which case we can look at certain details like uh, the HTTP headers and do some level of a packet inspection sort of analysis. If I, we are operating in a service mesh environment, we have got specific uh, configurations that we have done for Istio that will give us what we need. And uh, in cases where we absolutely don't have any access to the clear text, then we would be operating at a level four level, but we still discover all the connections, discover all the interac in, uh, interactions and who's talking to whom. And we are able to wire all of that in into the rest of the information that we get from Kubernetes and the cloud. So is that, I trust that, uh, I hope that answers your question. Uh, that reminds me, Sridhar, one of the things I did not show in the demo, given the time constraint is we are capturing not only the bytes and packets are layer, but also layer seven at the URL level, request counts and response times, but I didn't show that in detail. Okay, good. Thanks, Alok and Sridhar. Uh, an another one in via uh, chat. So uh, other monitoring vendors have started to integrate with these same CNCF tools. Uh, is that any different from what Ops Cruise uh, is doing? Um, so I, I, I can take that one and you guys sure. can add to sure, it. But, I can add to that. Um, uh, yeah, it's quite different. Um, uh, you know, from the ground up, we've architected on top of these, uh, on top of these tools. Uh, and uh, we're embedding these tools uh, and we're uh, providing support and distributions, uh, you know, for these tools. Um, you know, most of the um, traditional uh, you know, legacy monitoring vendors that are out there, um, you know, they've just uh, taken the data uh, from these tools and pushed them up to their cloud or their central uh, platform. They haven't fundamentally kind of re-architected their stack uh, to sit on top of this stuff. Um, and so it's quite a different 
uh, model. You'll, you'll be on your own to kind of support those tools and maintain them and upgrade them and so forth. Uh, and then further, um, you know, uh, the central repository for this kind of uh, data, you know, is those tools in, in the case of our deployment so that you can use it, as we talked about earlier in the presentation, for more than just monitoring. You'll be able to use that same data for capacity planning and uh, security and whatnot. Uh, the, the legacy vendors uh, tend to suck up all that data and store it in their cloud or their central platforms. And you, you pay for that, you know, ultimately. We only pull the data we need for our analytics and the central store remains uh, those um, CNCF uh, tools. So it's, it's quite a different uh, approach. I, you know, obviously we had the advantage of being a much younger company and starting in a new generation. And Scott, aren't you all you and Alok and Sridhar and the rest of the crew? Aren't you all veterans from your usual suspects of companies that come uh, from yeah, this legacy? Yeah, I mean, we, so you yeah. took some of the lessons of the past, right? And you're yeah. applying them. And you kind of, I mean, I, these were conversations that we had. If we were to do this all over again, instead of having, you know, BMC or HP or, yeah. you know, uh, Dynatrace or whatever, exactly. pick your legacy package, you had an opportunity to do it all over. And so here we are with something that you all have created that is for the modern world, next generation. Exactly, exactly. Yep, okay. you have that. And, and, and this non-invasive reduces the impact on the application. That's a huge benefit. Yeah, that part I love it. for the application development crew, right? Because I mean, uh, you know, as a, as a senior leader in IT, having a purview of both the voices from infrastructure operations, which sometimes can be conflicting with application development, and you got to listen to both. And you got to say, you know, folks, we, we all got to get along. Thus, the reason why I love DevOps. And this is very appropriate for that change in philosophy of the application developer throwing it over the fence, as opposed to have it be integrated. And Ops Cruise brings that integration and helps with that culture change for DevOps. Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah, absolutely. Um, good. One, one other one uh, in chat, Carl, that uh, might be fit for you. Uh, let's see, when you've embraced uh, these types of open source tools in, in, in your organizations, what's been the primary driver? Is it a, is it a, is it a cost dimension? Is innovation. It... Innovation. Innovation. Okay. Innovation. I mean, uh, you know, certainly there's a cost element to it, but nothing right. is free. Nothing is free. So if you think you can just download the open source, pay, you know, do the free thing and ride on top of it, then you become the integrator. Mm -hmm. So it does make sense to bring in some uh, uh, commercialization, which Opscrews does for this CNCF uh, set of uh, frameworks. But at the same time, to me, these, in this day and age, it's innovation. It's leveraging the power of the community. There's a cost issue. There's also legal and security ramifications, right? You got to make sure your lawyers are on board. You got to make sure your CISO is on board because just downloading open source and running it, you, you know, you may get... I know it happened to me maybe five, six years ago where we got a lawsuit from a, from a company that was a patent troll because we downloaded a little itty bitty piece of software that was in all the developers downloaded and embedded in their stuff. So yeah. you, you got to, as always, you got to involve all the parties, your, your attorneys, your compliance people, your vendor management people, uh, in addition to the IT professional. Got it. Got it. Oh, good, good insights, Carl. Um, okay. And then there's an, another one here on chat. Um, maybe for you, a local shooter, uh, how, how scalable, uh, you know, are these tools like Prometheus and Loki? I, I've, I've, I've seen them, you know, pretty pervasive in startups, but are they really ready for, you know, large enterprise environments? Sure, I'll, I'll take my first shot of that. Um, the good news about uh, in, in the last two years, actually, in Prometheus, there's scalable options. There are also CNCF projects. Uh, the two ones dominantly are Thanos, which allows you horizontal scaling as well, as well as able to collect more data and cortex. And we have had actually customers, Scott, if you remember that we're using Thomas as well to scale. I think there was one customer in a call had about 29 or no, 39 sites they were collecting data from and actually yeah. federating it and they're using Thomas. And we've come across more of them. Yeah. Now, Loki is a little newer, but Loki has a similar philosophy in architecture and how they scale out similarly. You know, the backend data store has to scale out to sharding, et cetera, and the collectors also scale out horizontally. Okay, Carl, you want to add to that or is something on your mind? No, no, just watching the time. So, yeah, go ahead. So, um, yeah, I just add that, uh, you know, on those uh, tools, you know, they were invented by, you know, some of, or they were incubated in some of the, 
um, you know, largest IT Scale. infrastructures in the world, like Google and Uber and whatnot. Um, and uh, yeah, you'd be amazed. Uh, you know, the uh, the 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 second largest, uh, the largest kind of brick and mortar retailer in the world. Uh, you know, is uh, uh, using uh, these platforms. Uh, uh, the largest telecom in the world is using these platforms. Uh, so you'd be you'd be surprised at um, uh, the the level of scale uh, on them. So Scott, as we end here, I got a question for you. How do I how do I use this stuff? How do I get it? How do I get my hands on it? Isn't it obvious in the slide, Carl? That's like a that's like a setup question. So, um, of course it is. yeah, I mean, you 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 can go to opscrews.com uh, and uh, and just sign up and register on our portal. There's a few adapters you'll install um, uh, if you have an existing uh, Prometheus or uh, Loki environment. A few adapters you install, or you can take the full package uh, and uh, install that in your environment. And uh, you'll, you'll start getting visibility in about 30 minutes and uh, the analytics will start kind of producing results in about a day. So um, um, yeah, awesome. uh, feel free to feel free to jump in. And uh, the uh, last and, and most important thing, we've got a short uh, drawing here. That's why all of you are really here uh, for this Oculus uh, VR headset. So I've, I've scratched all the names onto little pieces of paper and I'm gonna draw them out of my, uh, my secret mug. So uh, I got Matt Pavlik, Matt Pavlik. I don't know what organization Ooh. he's from, but uh, he's a lucky Wait, winner. Do you have to be? Do you have to be on the call to win, or or you could? Include I think he stuff? is because I I, I I checked in the beginning and I just uh, screenshot those names and and so Matt is uh, our winner this morning. So congratulations, Matt. Uh, I'd like to thank everybody uh, for attending. Uh, we will post the webinar. Uh, up online on our YouTube channel uh, over the next couple days. And if you have any other questions, feel free uh, to drop us a note. And uh, thanks again, Carl, for uh, making the time this morning. Uh, Thank you all. Us. Everybody enjoy the rest of their day. Thanks so much. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for joining. Bye-bye.